So thank you very much to Aaron, who apparently had asked the question, what are we going to do about Yemen? And that was part of what generated our gathering here today. And Susan, thank you so much for inviting me to come and picking me up to the Stony Point Center people. It's a privilege to be here with you, and certainly likewise to all who've come and to be with these colleagues. I think the urgency of our gathering tonight is indicated by the words that Mohammed bin Salman, the crown prince of Saudi Arabia, spoke on a nationalized, televised speech in Saudi Arabia on May 2nd of 2017, when he said, a prolonged war is in our interest regarding the war in Yemen. He said, time is on our side regarding the war in Yemen. And I see that as particularly urgent because it's likely that the Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, who is by all accounts the orchestrator of the Saudi-led coalition's involvement in prolonging the war in Yemen, is going to come to the United States. In Britain, they managed to push back his arrival there. There was such a strong movement led by um, young Quakers, actually, in the UK. And um, he probably will come to the United States, and most certainly, if that trip happens, to New York. And I think that gives us an opportunity to say to him and to all of the people focused on him that time is not on the side of the civilians who suffer desperately and their situation will be described much further throughout the course of our evening together. I've been asked to speak a bit about the uh, war, the history of the war, and the proxy wars and the causes. And, and I want to say most humbly to Abdur that I know that any child in the Yemeni marketplace selling peanuts in the corner will always know more about the culture and the history of Yemen than I ever can. <laughs> Something I've learned over the years with Voices for Creative Nonviolence is that if we wait till we're perfect, we'll wait a very long time. So I'll just <laughs> jump in. And I think one place to start is with the Arab Spring. As it began to unfold in 2011 in Bahrain at the Pearl Mosque, the Arab Spring was a very, very courageous manifestation. Likewise in Yemen. And I mostly want to say that young people in Yemen risk their lives beautifully to raise grievances. Now, what were those grievances that so motivated people to take very valiant stances? Well, uh, they're all true today, and they're, they're things that people can't abide with. Under the 33-year dictatorship of Ali Abdullah Salah, Yemen's resources were not being distributed and shared in any kind of equitable way with Yemeni people. There was an elitism, a cronyism, if you will. And so problems that should never have been neglected were becoming alarming. One problem was the lowering of the water table. You don't address that and your farmers can't grow crops and the pastoralists can't herd their flocks. And so people were becoming desperate. And desperate people were going to the cities and the cities were becoming swamped with people, many more people than they could accommodate in terms of sewage and sanitation and health care and schooling. And also in Yemen there were cutbacks on fuel subsidies and this meant that people couldn't transport goods and so the economy was reeling from that. The unemployment was going higher and higher and young university students realized there's no job for me when I graduate and so they banded together. But these young people were remarkable also because they recognized the need to make common cause, not just with the academics and the artists who were centered in, say, Ta'iz, or with the um, very vigorous organizations in Sana'a, but they reached out to the ranchers. Men, for instance, who never left their house without carrying their rifle. And they persuaded them to leave the guns at home and to come out and engage in nonviolent manifestations, even after plainclothes men on rooftops shot at the place called Change Square that they had set up in Sana'a and killed 50 people. The discipline these young people maintained was remarkable. They organized a 200 kilometer walk, walking side by side with the ranchers and the peasantry, the common people, and they went from Ta'is to Sana'a. Some of their colleagues had been placed in terrible prisons, and they did a lengthy fast outside the prison. I mean, it sounds as though they had Jean Sharp's you know, table of contents 
and were going through the nonviolent methods they could use. And they were also just spot on about the main problems Yemen was facing. They should have been given a voice. They should have been included in any negotiations. People should have blessed their presence. They were sidelined. They were ignored. And then civil war broke out. And the means that these young people had tried to use became all the more dangerous. Now, I want to comment that at this point in southern Yemen, the United Arab Emirates, part of the Saudi-led coalition, are running 18 clandestine prisons among the methods of torture, documented by Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch, is one in which a person's body is trussed to a spit that rotates over an open flame. So when I ask myself, well, what happened to those young people? Well, <coughs> when you're facing possible torture, imprisonment from multiple groups, when chaos breaks out, when it becomes so, so dangerous to speak up, I know that I, for my safety and my security, have to be very careful about asking well, where is that movement? I want to go back to the history of Ali Abdullah Saleh. Because of some very skilled diplomats, and because of the Gulf Corporation Council, which was various countries represented this council in the Saudi Peninsula, and because people, by and large, who were part of these elites didn't want to lose their power, Salah was edged out. Um, a very skillful diplomat, his name was Al Aryani, was one of the people who managed to get people to come to a negotiating table. But these students, the Arab Spring representatives, the people representing these various grievances, were not included. And so, as Salah more or less went out the door after his 30 year, three year dictatorship, he said, Well, I will appoint my successor. And he appoint, appointed Abd Rabu Mansur Hadi. Hadi is now the internationally recognized president of Yemen, but he's not the elected president. There was never an election. He was appointed. At some point after Saleh had left, there was an attack on his compound. Some of his bodyguards were wounded and killed. He himself was wounded, and it took him months to recover. And he decided that's it. He decided to make a compact with people he had formerly persecuted and fought against, who were amongst the group called the Houthi rebels. And they were well equipped. They marched into Sana'a, took it over. The internationally elected president, Abdurrahman Mansur, Abdurrahman Mansur Hadi, fled. He is still living in Riyadh. And that's why we talk about a proxy war now. The civil war continued, but in March of 2015, Saudi Arabia decided, well, we'll enter into that war and represent Hadi's governance. And when they came in, they came in with a full cache of weaponry. And under the Obama administration, they were sold. And Boeing, Raytheon, these major corporations love to sell weapons to the Saudis because they pay cash on the barrel head. They were sold for combat littoral ships. Littoral meaning they can go along the side of a coastline, and the, the blockades went into effect, which greatly contributed towards starvation, toward an inability to distribute desperately needed goods. They were sold a Patriot missile system. They were sold uh, laser-guided missiles. And then very importantly, the United States said, yes, when your jets go up to do the bombing sorties that will be described by my colleagues here, we will refuel them. They can go over, bomb Yemen, come back into Saudi airspace. The US jets will go up, refuel them in midair. Nick can talk more about that. And then you can go back and bomb some more. Iona Craig, a very respected journalist from Yemen, has said that if the midair refueling stopped, the war would end tomorrow. So the Obama administration was very, very supportive. But at one point, 149 people had gathered for a funeral. It was a funeral for a very well-known governor in Yemen, and uh, the double tap was done. The Saudis first bombed the funeral, and then when people came to do rescue work, to do relief, a second bombing. And the Obama administration said, that's it. We can't guarantee 
that you're not committing war crimes when you hit these targets. Well, by then they had already bombed four Doctors Without Borders hospitals. Um, keep in mind the United States had bombed the Doctors Without Borders Hospital October 2nd, 2015, October 27th. The Saudis did it. Ban Ki-moon tried to say to the Saudi Brigadier General Azeri, you know, you can't go around bombing hospitals. And the general said, well, we'll ask our American colleagues for better advice about targeting. So think about the green lighting that Guantanamo creates when the United Arab Emir Emirates has a network of 18 clandestine prisons. Think about the green lighting that our bombing of the Médecins Sans Frontières, Doctors Without Borders Hospital, creates, and then the Saudis do it. We have played an enormous role, we as United States people, whose governance has been involved steadily in the Civil War and the Saudi-led coalition war. We can call that a proxy war also because of the involvement of nine different countries, including Sudan. How is Sudan involved? Mercenaries. Feared Janjaweed mercenaries are hired by the Saudis to fight on up the coast. So when the crown prince says, time is on our side, he knows that those mercenaries are taking small town after small town after small town, getting very close to the vital court of Hodeida. He knows that they've got loads of weapons and more coming because our President Trump, when he went over to dance with the princes, promised that the spigot is back on and the United States will again sell weapons. I want to close by mentioning that when, a little over a year ago, President Trump gave an address to both houses of Congress, he lamented the death of a Navy SEAL. And the Navy SEAL's widow was in the audience. She was trying to maintain her composure. She was crying bitterly. And he shouted over the applause that went on for four minutes as all the senators and all the congressmen gave this woman a standing ovation. It was a very strange event. And President Trump was shouting, you know he'll never be forgotten. You know he's up there looking down on you. Well, I began to wonder, well, where was he killed? And nobody ever said during the whole of that evening presentation that um, Chief Petty Officer Ryan Owen was killed in Yemen. And that same night, in the village, a remote agricultural village of al -Gayal. Navy SEALs who had undertaken an operation suddenly realized we're in the middle of a botched operation. The neighboring <coughs> tribes people came with guns and they disabled the helicopter that the Navy SEALs had landed in. And a gun battle broke out, the Navy SEALs called in air support, and that same night, six mothers were killed and Ten children under age 13 were among the 26 killed. A young 30-year-old mother, her name was uh, Fahim, had not known what to do when a missile tore through her house. And so she grabbed one infant in her arm and she took the hand of her five-year-old son and she started shepherding the 12 children in that house that had just been torn apart outside because she thought that was the thing to do. And then who knows, maybe you know the heat sensors picked up her presence emerging out of the building. She was killed by a bullet at the back of her head. Her son described exactly what happened. And because of, I think of American exceptionalism, mm -hmm. we only know of one person, and we don't even know where he was killed on that night. And so to overcome that exceptionalism, to reach out the hand of friendship, to say that we do not believe time is on the side of any child at risk of starvation, disease, and their families who simply want to live. Time is not on their side. Thank you. Thank you. Rabia Al-Faybani is a, a Yemeni-American activist. Uh, she's been here in New York, and uh, Brooklyn and Queens since 1985. Her husband, uh, she's estranged from her husband who cannot come here because of the travel ban. Um, she uh, works for Al Jazeera. She works with civil rights and with uh, nonprofit housing. And Rabia's going to tell us a little bit about the Yemeni experience both here and back in Yemen. Thank you, thank you. Um, that was, wow. You just brought me back, first of all, to um, the Arab Spring. And I kind of got emotional. <laughs> just thinking about, seriously, how what an amazing, amazing time that was for all of us. Because we, we organized 
against Ali Abdullah Saleh for years, you know, against the regime. And we supported, we were, you know, my husband was on the ground in Yemen and part of the, you know, the entire, um, you know, movement over there. And so just you talking about all of these, all those events that happened just, just brought back all these memories. Um, but yeah, I do want to focus on, um, on, on how this, uh, this war has impacted me directly, personally, but also um, Yemeni Americans, and how Trump's ban or the Muslim ban has also, you know, it was already so very difficult, um, and you know, with the war, and then to have people, you know, the, these really um, horrible policies coming out at a time when Yemenis are like fleeing violence, is just uh, it's been very very difficult. So in 2011. Um, you know, we, we organized, there was so much hope out there. We were like very united here in, in the U.S. as, you know, uh, Yemeni Americans living outside of Yemen. The best we could do is just try to support people on the ground by organizing, educating others. And it was really, you know, um, very, we were very much united, um, you know. And same was happening in Yemen, like, you know. The youth, the young people, like the Houthis were also in Chain Square. I was just telling Abdu, you know, there was everybody from all walks of life just united around this common cause, and then it all just fell apart after the national dialogue kind of collapsed. And, and then, like you explained so brilliantly, like, you know, the war and the Houthis come in and take over um, in 2014, and then in March of 2015, the Saudis start their bombing campaign, and this is actually in 2014 where the majority of people just started to escape uh, or, like, get their families. And mind you, I, I think more than 90% of Yemenis in the United States are here. Um, uh, they're American citizens. They've been here for since the 60s, 70s. Um, so these are mostly children and uh, wives and, and, and women that are escaping the war to join uh, American citizen, uh, you know, like the, their spouses and the fathers. And, and so um, they had petitions. Some of them had petitions, um, but there was no embassy anymore in Sana'a. So the only way, by the way, at this time, the Saudi bombing and the, the blockade, the only way to get out of Sana'a was to travel um, through, uh, very dangerous, by the way, with the bombing, and then to go to the south in Aden, which is about was it, eight hours or 10 driving, but with all the check, with all the violence that was happening and all the, the, the security, and, and it, it takes at least two days now to get from Sana'a to, uh, to Aden, and so that's the first part, and then the second part is to to get from Aden to Djibouti by boat, and so thousands of people escaped that way. Um, a lot of them went to Djibouti, where the American embassy um, was, you know, trying to process as many, you know. Uh, petitions and it was going okay at first, and then Trump came, came, you know, he came to power. Trump is here, and you know, a lot of the rhetoric that that we heard during the campaign, I thought we all thought it was just talk. I would have never. I mean, in, I'm being honest. I was like, well, there's no way he's gonna like, you know, what? What's a Muslim ban anyways? This is just not American. What? What? No, it's, it can't happen. And yeah. Uh, the first week, his number one uh, item on his agenda was the Muslim ban, and you all remember how horrific that weekend was. And I was at JFK, and and it was just like, oh my God! I remember like me and Sama like were like trying to translate because there was a leaked version of the ban, and I'm like, there's no way this is this is what he's gonna sign. Mm -hmm. And yes, he signed it on Friday at like 4:59, you know, knowing full well that the airports are going to be full of travelers, and it's just horrific. And we were like trying to, you know, inform people. Um, people were scared. They, were, they had family members that were either traveling, had visas, or it was just really very, very difficult. My husband, um, who had already, you know, I already petitioned for him. I did his interview, at, you know, November uh, of 2016. Um, everything seemed to be going well. I was hoping that by at least by, you know, March or April, he was going to be here with me of last year. Um, but no, there goes the first ban and, um, and then everything. I mean, I don't know, not one single Yemeni family that's not impacted um, by the war in Yemen and the ban. So we are, they're experiencing violence in Yemen that we are helping, like, you know, helping this war, like Susan explained, you know, 
supporting the Saudis in their bombing, refueling planes. It's just we are just, we're actively involved in this war, the United States. And, and now we have um, three different bands or versions of these bands. And we were just excited today to hear that the Fourth Circuit had ruled um, against the third Muslim ban and that it's unconstitutional. And now we're going to go to the Supreme Court. So we've been, you have families, you have um, the Yemenis that have escaped the war all over the world, like literally throughout the Middle East. They're in Egypt, they're in Jordan, they're in um, Djibouti, they're in Malaysia. I um, mean, these are all, they've been out, you know, it's almost two and a half years since, almost three years now. And the kind of, the, the financial toll this has taken on their family members here that are trying to bring them here, because it's not easy or cheap to support an fam a, a entire family, let's say in Djibouti. It's very expensive. Um, and, and to be, you know, separated from their family members under such, such a horrible, horrible times, especially with what's happening in Yemen. It's it's very difficult, you know. My my, I'm I get to go and visit my husband, but you know, I married him in January 2016, and I've only actually been able to see him what three times in three years. And I'm an American citizen, but you know, obviously, the our president doesn't believe, you know, um, I have the same rights that he does. Um, and so my, my constitutional rights are not on the same page or the same, you know, as a, a you know, woman of color, brown folks. And this is the whitening of America. They, they, the, the, we have three different um, bands and all, the courts have struck all of them. And yet, at this point, there's literally no immigration from these countries whatsoever. Uh, I think there's like, I don't know how many, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people that are right now aren't able to come into the U.S. Um, and these are, again, if I'm talking about Yemeni Americans, these are, uh, Abde, for example, my friend, his family, he's an American, and his kids, his wife, you know. But it's just really <laughs> very emotional, sorry. Mm, it's okay. Sorry, Marie. <laughs> I think I'm done. <laughs>